My name is Dr. Ginny Mantello, and um, I work with uh, Borough President Otto as um, his Director of Health and Wellness. Uh, when he start, took office and became the Borough President back uh, in early 20, 2014, he decided to make health uh, a big part of his priority and his platform, and so he brought me on board to really look at what are the health issues, what are the health disparities. Uh, facing Staten Island and Staten Islanders and together we've been working uh, for these past almost four years uh, on addressing many of these issues. Okay. What are some of the um, mission and values of the uh, Office of, of the Department of Health and Wellness? So um, as I mentioned um, this was really a priority uh, for the borough president uh, when he came on. Um, we also know that Staten Island and Staten Islanders um, suffer from um, many chronic disorders um, and, and we have rates higher than the city um, in a lot of uh, different health aspects. Uh, for instance, our smoking rates are a lot higher, we have higher cancer rates, higher heart disease, higher obesity. Um, so really thinking about how can we empower Staten Islanders to make healthy choices, lead a healthier lifestyle. Um, we know that there are certain things that are um, not in our control, uh, but then there are uh, healthy choices that uh, individuals can make and they owe it to their family and their friends um, to make those choices. For instance, um, you know, tobacco use for one is, is an example, limiting the amount of alcohol. Um, you know, eating healthy and exercising. So these are things that, these are health factors that really, and healthy lifestyles that impact your health outcomes. And so we were hopeful that uh, we could help bringing in education, prevention, upstream prevention, early intervention to help Staten Islanders and give them the tools to be able to make those healthy choices. How does the Department of Health and Wellness use collaboration and partnerships to help improve um, health outcomes in Staten Island? So for us, it's been all about collaborations and partnerships. Uh, we understand that uh, we have limited capacity to actually uh, go out in the community and uh, address a lot of these issues. And um, they're very complex issues that we're talking about. There's not one um, simple answer. There's not one organization or individual that can actually um, you know, do it alone. And so um, my focus has also been keeping sort of a bird's eye view uh, from 30,000 feet high, looking at how we can uh, align individuals towards a common agenda, looking at how we can partner and uh, collaborate. And uh, many of our uh, large coalitions, some of, who, uh, some of which I've actually been instrumental in setting up, uh, use uh, a concept called collective impact, where we bring uh, multiple uh, leadership from cross sectors um, and sit around the table and really address complex issues aligning towards data with the help of data towards uh, a common agenda. So uh, examples of some of what we've done is the Child Wellness Initiative, uh, which started off um, at Borough Hall as a childhood obesity project. We looked at the uh, community needs assessment. We knew obesity and chronic disease was a big issue on Staten Island. Um, and so we decided we want to do upstream prevention, work on childhood obesity, teach children from when they're early on, how to adopt healthy lifestyle, eat right, um, address the environment, look at active design, look at schools, um, and then also look at healthcare. So really looking at where a child lives, uh, but also learns, plays, and receives healthcare. Um, and of course, we, we are very mindful of the fact that while a lot of these programs, and we've done this with our asthma coalition as well, using similar concept, uh, we're mindful of the fact that we want it to be a borough-wide uh, initiative, but also knowing that certain neighborhoods and certain zip codes uh, need more than others, uh, keeping you know health equity in mind. We make sure that uh, we look at the disparities, look at where the data is pointing us, look at income, look at you know, um, socioeconomic status, race, so on and so forth, and do a little bit more work in those neighborhoods. 
And I think it's only recently that the public health community and the health community has really understood that health outcomes are driven by so many factors and just having a good healthcare facility is only like 20% of the equation. Of course, healthy behaviors, healthy lifestyle contributes to it, but then the social determinants of health have a very large impact. So not only the physical environment, but also things like uh, socioeconomic status, housing, transportation, um, you know, violence, um, safety, all of these things, uh, and connectedness play a very, very big part in an individual's health outcomes. So um, there are actually um, a fair number of initiatives that we're working on uh, to improve the outcome of children and families. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the child wellness um, initiative works on looking at um, you know, obesity, um, looking at where a child lives, um, plays, learns, and receives healthcare, but knowing well that when you're talking about uh, improving all of these conditions for children, you have to do it in uh, conjunction with their families, um, and you have to make sure that um, you know the, the parents are as empowered as the children to make changes within the home uh, and, and how they eat or exercise. Uh, in addition to that, we have the uh, Childhood Asthma Coalition, and part of it is educating the parents and the family um, on how do you address the triggers, uh, what are some of the things that need to be done um, in terms of um, education, in terms of the Asthma Action Plan, how you can uh, perhaps control the asthma in a community setting and not have to go to the emergency room. Um, in addition to that, there are um, a couple of large coalitions. One uh, addresses perinatal issues, maternal fetal health, um, and that's looking at infant mortality uh, focused on the North Shore. There's another initiative called the Staten Island Alliance for Children and Families that also looks at education and health outcomes from zero to eight in the North Shore. Uh, we also have a very robust tackling youth substance abuse coalition, which looks at um, the substance use issue in the community, and we're working throughout the continuum. Um, Borough Hall has a large focus on the prevention and early intervention aspect of substance use, and we have uh, a prevention and school-based task force that meets regularly at Borough Hall. So these are just some of the um, coalitions that are working on addressing uh, the needs of children and family. And again, you know, I can't stress enough that you cannot um, work with the child in isolation. You have to work with them um, you know, and work with the family as a unit if you want to make some sort of meaningful impact and change. We're happy to announce that we are uh, finally going to have cardiac rehab again on Staten Island. And this was um, something that we've been missing for a number of years uh, in our borough, the cardiac rehab programs which existed closed down um, through our um, health and wellness task force um, and also the borough president regularly convenes um, roundtables on some issues on Staten Island. We invited a number of cardiologists and health leaders to come and think through uh, what um, you know are the issues on Staten Island, what is missing, how this administration can help and the, the, um, the people around the table identified that uh, we don't have a cardiac rehab program on Staten Island. And it, this is something the cardiologists feel very passionately about that is evidence-based and that um, can reduce the mortality post-operative and also in, in people with cardiac issues up to 20%, uh, sometimes even more in women. And uh, we identified that there's a great need because people don't want to leave the borough and go off island for um, addressing these um, issues. and. So through the help of the borough president, and he, he's funded both hospitals, um, $250,000 for the equipment, we've been able to get buy-in from both hospitals and their administration to restart um, the cardiac rehab program. Richmond University um, it has, um, is going to have this up and running early this year, and Staten Island University Hospital is also uh, working on identifying how they're going to implement this. Um, in addition to that, we have other initiatives focused on heart disease. We have the um, AED issue, uh, the initiative um, where the borough president's office gives out um, the defibrillator defibrillators to small businesses. Uh, we've given out 19 defibrillators so far, and the goal is to give uh, 30. Uh, the small businesses are defined by less than 25 employees, and they're tasked um, to actually uh, apply for this, but also to get their employees trained. Uh, we've also worked with schools and actually um, worked with Portrichman High School to make them the first CPR uh, smart school in New York City. 
Um, and that was back in um, 2015, I believe. Um, and, and we're also working very closely with the American Heart Association on a number of issues. Um, also, they work with us on our obesity coalition, um, helping children uh, get, you know, uh, eat healthy and um, lower their risk for heart disease. So these are just uh, some of the things that we've done um, uh, around heart, heart disease. And the AED um, uh, initiative is called the Heart Project. What is the administration approach on addressing cancer? So um, I don't know if you're aware, but Staten Island um, certainly has higher cancer rates um, than the other boroughs. And actually, the governor was here recently announcing um, a new grant with the um, State Department of Health that they will be doing a study to see why the rates of cancer are higher on Staten Island. But uh, we in our administration have been actually uh, mindful of this, we've been looking at data from the state and also um, through our community needs, uh, realizing that we have higher cancer rates. Um, so regularly every year, um, the borough president convenes um, roundtables around specific cancers. Uh, breast cancer uh, was something that he was focusing on even before he became a borough president. He was a councilman. He was focusing on breast cancer, but breast cancer is an example lung cancer, colon cancer. So we bring experts around the table to identify how we could work together with them. Um, so one of the things that we've done um, through the best breast cancer uh, focus, for instance, uh, there, there are, uh, we put out social media information for individuals on what are the questions they should ask their doctors. Uh, we've um, had um, mammography units that are sponsored through our office um, and also other free mammography units on Staten Island that are brought to neighborhoods where people don't have access and these are free for individuals to go and get um, their yearly mammograms. We understand well that that early detection is key and screening can save lives so this is a, a message we've consistently pushed out whether it be breast cancer or lung cancer or colon cancer. Um, this, this year, this past year we also um, um, had free Uber rides in partnership with, with our offer, office where women could get a ride to and from getting their mammography. As far as lung cancer, uh, we have been working with the hospitals. Uh, they have screening programs and we've been uh, promoting that message uh, around free lung cancer screenings uh, to the community um, and also with colon cancer. We've, we've definitely partnered with the hospitals and the community to spread the message and increase our screening rates on Staten Island. In terms of the social media initiative that you've taken, uh, can you, for, for those that don't know, what is the handle or the hashtag that's being used to promote um, preventing bre breast cancer or um, those so, so we have um, four PSAs that were created out of the office um, that are on our website. So they, it can be accessed by uh, statonusa.com slash wellness. So can you comment or um, respond to the BP um, addressing or framing the issue of mental illness um, and drug use on the island? Sure. Um, so the BP is not only very passionate about the health and well-being of his uh, constituents, but early on when he took office, um, the substance use epidemic was really um, getting out of control and exploding. And one of the first few things um, as he took office and as he brought me on was we attended uh, a number of um, local uh, hearings at the Department of Health and locally in our community, town halls, um, and we really understood the, the severity and the gravity and the depth of the situation and he decided early on that this was a problem he was going to own and he really wanted to make a difference. Um, we have been working very hard, uh, you know, it's been a multi-pronged approach. Uh, while our office has predominantly been focusing on uh, upstream prevention and early intervention, we have also been supporting uh, initiatives around treatment as well as recovery. Um, we also understand well, and as a healthcare, um, as a physician, as a healthcare provider, um, I really understand not only why addiction happens, but also the fact that it, it is a, a medical issue and that we need to remove the stigma from, from uh, addiction. Uh, I work very closely with, uh, with physicians, uh, trying to get them to start certain medication-assisted treatments in the community. Um, so we've been working on, as I said, on the treatment. We also have a very robust task force on, um, that's focused on prevention, 
um, and early intervention that, that's at Borough Hall. In addition to that, I sit on the steering committee of a borough-wide task force, which looks at the entire continuum. Um, I also understand well, and, and um, you know, it's been important to understand that mental health as an underlying uh, cause uh, in addiction and a very large percentage of individuals that have substance use disorders have underlying mental health issues. Also understanding that one in five New Yorkers um, suffer from mental health um, disorders. So now we really are more mindful of using the term behavioral health, uh, which encompasses both men mental health and substance use. So a lot of our strategies that we're working on through the Medicaid reform program, and that's something that I didn't touch on yet, but uh, we have, um, through the State Department of Health and through the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, Staten Island has received a lot of funding uh, to work with the Medicaid population, and uh, substance use is one of the big issues um, and big focus um, focuses through that, um, through that um, sort of reform program. Um, and we work on behavioral health issues um, on not only increasing access to treatment, uh, but reducing emergency room visits and uh, reducing hospitalizations um, and trying to work through, the, through uh, collaborations on the substance use issue. Can you tell us about the success of the Too Good for Drug initiative? Sure. Um, so the Too Good for Drugs uh, program was started as a pilot program back in 2015. Um, due to this administration wanting to pr uh, prioritize prevention um, and also seeing the need of, um, you know, that there was not a consistent prevention program available for youth in schools. Uh, we started this um, as a pilot in five um, Staten schools. Uh, it's an evidence-based curriculum. Uh, what's unique about the Too Good for Drugs program on Staten Island that, uh, is that it was co-taught or co-facilitated um, by an NYPD officer. Um, our NYPD uh, borough commander, uh, Chief Delator, has been a visionary and also a leader. He's trained all the policemen in the Too Good for Drugs program. Uh, we saw that there was a great success after the initial pilot, and thanks to the leadership of the borough president and the chief, um, the NYPD chief, uh, there was more funding that they were able to accrue and last year we expanded it to all fifth grade classes on Staten Island and then this year uh, the plan is to have it in all fifth grade as well as seventh and ninth grade um, classes on Staten Island and again um, as I mentioned uh, the, all the NYPD officers are, are trained in this um, they go in and they uh, teach the program and it's facilitated either by a substance abuse prevention counselor funded through the Office of Alcohol and Substance Use or through a, a teacher in the younger grades. Um, and we've shown a tremendous amount of success um, in improving community relations um, and, and the children um, really love having an officer in their school and, and um, I think this is uh, a good success story that we could, we could talk about for our community. So is the Teen Intervene program associated with the Too Good for Drugs program? Um, so the Teen Intervene is, um, is an early intervention program and um, I say this often is when we're looking at the overdose death rate, we're only looking at the tip of the iceberg. Um, what's um, remarkable that in speaking to um, youth that are either using or abusing, um, they feel that 90 to 95 percent of youth that are in high school and even late in middle school are either experimenting or thinking of using or in um, sort of some sort of contact peripherally with people that are using. And so we are actually missing a very, very large percentage of the youth that we know are um, at risk. And so an, the early intervention program really looks at the children that are at risk and how do we prevent them from becoming users and abusers. So it is really an intervention that you put in um, if you identify people at children at risk. Um, and then a counselor really sits with the, these youth uh, and counsels them for up to five or six sessions. And um, by, lesson, by counsel, counseling four or five, you bring the parents in and you counsel them as well. And so this is a program we've worked with the Office of Alcohol and Substance Use. We know it's an evidence-based program. We've worked with them to start this program in multiple high schools. Uh, we started it in one high school and then we expanded it. And last year we had it at Tottenville High School, uh, Portrichman High School, Concord High School, and um, 
I believe, Newdorp High School. So, uh, I'm sorry, Curtis High School. So um, we've also been in conversations with other high schools and they're interested in this model. So thinking through whether uh, we should be universally screening youth when, once they come into high school or just screening ones that are referred or the ones that are high risk or the ones that are identified by teachers in the school and how we work through this model where the counselors that are already in the school um, help with this and help counsel these children. We also have two prevention programs, the YMCA and UAU on Staten Island that are helping us with this program and they actually go into the school to help us with the screenings but also are available if we need help with counseling and even up to uh, treatment because the YMCA even offers treatment. In terms of, I know you, you touched on even having the program at the beginning when students come into the school system, um, how far along the thought process uh, is the BP on that? Um, so. Um, we have actually, I think the, the issue with, with screening everybody is more a logistic piece. Uh, we have many large um, high schools and so logistically, while everybody does understand the need, um, how do we uh, screen large groups of individuals um, knowing that it's going to take away time from academics or other things that they're doing. And so some of what we've been, been able to build in is look at perhaps where either a health class or, or you know, where the counsel, substance abuse counselor is going to be doing a, a curriculum anyway to see how we can bring some of these screenings into those classes. And then uh, other models we've tried is um, they have a Freshman Connect class in some schools that meets regularly. Do we bring the screenings into those, those classes and do them in a group setting? So I think more than um, um, recognizing the need and, and there's buy-in in terms of you know, the need to screen, but logistically, um, how do we get it done in schools that have thousands of children? What makes the heroin overdose prevention and education program HOPE uh, stand <clears throat> out from other drug usage and recovery programs? So um, the HOPE program is really a unique program. Um, this is um, being spearheaded the, by the district attorney's office and we really have been at the table from day one, uh, from inception. Um, and it is a post-arrest, pre-arraignment diversion, different from some of the other diversion programs that have been done um, nationally. Um, we have collaboration with the health department, uh, the NYPD, uh, Legal Aid Society, um, and, and many, many other public um, um, you know, organizations and government organizations. Um, for months we met and came around the table to really think through this, the process. Um, and um, what the DA and his office had identified that there is a group of individuals um, that receive something called a desk appearance ticket for low-lying offenses and um, there was a, a large percentage of those that were either caught with uh, possessing drugs or, or um, and so how could we take the, that group uh, of individuals that were being arrested for these uh, misdemeanors or low-lying offenses and help them not only um, perhaps get a Narcan training, but really meet them where they are and try to uh, get them to be assessed by licensed professionals and then help them into some sort of treatment, whether it be uh, an early intervention or a harm reduction or an actual uh, treatment program. And uh, the program started in January of 2017 and already we've had over 300 uh, individuals that have um, connected that we've through this program and I, have, I will tell you that if you look at the numbers, the success has been overwhelming. Um, I would say 95% of the people that are offered the program actually accept the program. Uh, within seven days, they have to, to come back to say that they, uh, after being arrested, they have to come back to say they accept it. And then they have 30 days after that to show some sort of meaningful engagement with the healthcare community. Um, they also get have a peer that's funded that comes to meet them at the precinct, does a Narcan training, goes over the pro program with them, and the peer is available 24-7. So I slightly touched on this, but how do residents in the community go about accessing some of the resources that have been provided through the office of the borough president? So, you know, there's many ways to access. Um, of course, you have to be uh, engaged um, as a, as a um, community member and as a resident. Um, we, we understand well that um, a lot of the youth and the young adults 
um, get a lot of that information through social media. So we have been um, focusing, um, you know, on trying to get get the message out through social media. In addition, we understand that um, there are individuals that cannot access um, healthcare due to uh, transportation issues or other issues uh, with childcare. Um, there are, through the um, Medicaid reform program, there is now funding for something called care coordination, uh, where um, any individual that has a health issue can get connected to a care coordinator, and that care coordinator can actually help you with, um, with the social determinants, be it transportation or childcare, or just making appointments with the doctors. Um, so they are actually available to the community, and it's a free program funded through the PPS. Um, in addition to that, um, an example was that we partnered with Uber to provide free rides. We also have our mobile uh, mammography units that go out into the community. We have uh, mobile um, units through um, the two hospitals, uh, through Sharan University Hospital, as well as through Health and Hospital, and also through Community Health Action of Staten Island. These mobile units um, have sort of a schedule where they go provide vaccinations um, and provide information to the community. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've also made sure like City Harvest has mobile units that are available in areas of high need. So uh, again, it's, there's not one answer. Um, you know, so people, there are resources um, that are available. Uh, we try our best to put it out um, through, whether it be through, on, um, through health events, uh, health fairs, through flyers, through social media, through actually making the mobile units available. Um, and and um, you know any which way we can get the information out, we, we try to do that. But the, a lot of things uh, are happening where we have free funding for the Medicaid population. And I would urge people to sort of keep a lookout for this. A lot of it gets posted on our, our on Staten Island USA website as yet as well. So we have um, the calendars of the hospitals, um, any of our um, CBO partners, um, if they have events going on, or even the SIPPS. Uh, we partner with them on multiple large uh, events. Okay. So we post that on our Staten Island USA website. How do residents begin the process of advocating for resources or resource uh, allocation to combat some of the health disparities from the community level? So I think that um, the, the residents um, need to understand that um, this is a big focus, whether it be uh, through the health department or the borough president's office. Uh, we want to make sure and be mindful um, that every, each and every um, individual um, deserves the right to, to be healthy and um, that they, um, you know, health is a fundamental right and how do we help people uh, regardless of income or race uh, attain that highest level of health and it's a big um, push from the city and state health departments, from the CDC, from the borough president's office. So I think the, the key is for residents to be engaged but then also understanding what in their community is lacking so um, you know and then reaching out and engaging with uh, their local governments but also uh, perhaps with the city and state governments uh, whether it be by phone or social media or in person um, also understanding that we um, uh, take our constituents' concerns very seriously, uh, as I'm sure a lot of other government offices do. Um, so really being engaged, um, understanding um, what the actual issues are in your neighborhood and your zip code and your part of the community, and then uh, working together um, along with other leaders in your neighborhood. Um, to work with the with the local governments, and I think that that um, it would be important to kind of prioritize. Uh, we did this with the City Department of Health. They had the Take Care New York, um, and and uh, they came in um, and assessed. Actually, did con community convenings to see what are the top priorities. And we were all surprised to find that the two neighborhoods that they came in, the neighborhoods and the leaders um, that were polled actually picked violence as the number one issue in their community. So every zip code, every neighborhood is going to look different uh, and has different issues. But I think it's important for people to realize that they really need to understand what are the issues in their neck of the woods, their neighborhood, their zip code, and then working with their local leaders to come and work in, in collaboration with with our office and also with the city and state offices. This administration, the borough president, um, is, is extremely committed 
uh, to the health and well-being of the community. And this is not something that we can do alone. Uh, this is something that we have to do in partnership with the community. And um, again, um, any help that's needed, we are here, I say this all the time, please reach out. Um, if I don't have the answer, I'll be able to forward you to somebody who does. Um, but you know, we need to do this in, in collaboration.